look at your portion size, look at when you eat and how you eat, and look at the order in which you're eating it. Then add in your routine, your movement routine. Um, you can do those things. I do those things. Uh, and and they, they really do work. I'm excited <laughs> to talk about all things menopause. Yes, this is as not, I would expect you would be. Of course. I mean, who isn't? Well, 50% of the population, come on, female. Right. And 60% right. of a woman's life is going to be spent after the age of 40. Thank you for saying that. It's That's a big, correct. super important topic. Yeah, why are we not talking about it? For an underserved demographic. Yeah, yeah. It's a, it's a very interesting, it's an interesting conversation in and of itself. Like, it, why? Yeah. Yeah. Now, correct me if I'm wrong. I pulled up a statistic. Uh, it was from a 2013 study that mm -hmm. one in five, correct me if I'm wrong, OBGYN residents get menopause medicine training. So oh, you yeah. didn't I even think, teach you this I think in that might school. even be a little bit of an overestimate. Wow. I mean, there are a lot of there are a lot of studies that have similar numbers looking at like the confidence level of senior residents coming out of OBGYN residency in discussing managing and treating menopause. They're all similar. They're all well under 20%. I mean, wow. yeah, it's it's a real problem. Real and, problem. and I don't want to disparage our training, you know, they're trying to stuff in a lot of stuff in four years. But I think it says a lot about our priorities and it's, it shouldn't be too surprising. I mean, aging plus women, ooh, scary. Yeah. That's not something people want to talk about, but we need to talk about it. So how do we, how do we biohack, for lack of a better term, our, our age, right? Because yeah. we're all on this sort of people mover toward decrepitude, right? Right. And you pack this book, Menopause Bootcamp, with some really powerful um, secrets, tools, hacks yeah. uh, that women can use to to really change the course that seems to be so typical for, for women. So yeah, let's start there. How do we hack our well, I mean, the, fir the first one is not pretending that it's not going to happen hmm. because if, if it doesn't happen, that's not a good thing. <laughs> that means you're not here. So I think, I think this, I think a lot of the focus on women and aging has, as I mentioned and alluded to been very negative. And I think a lot of it has gotten focused on the way we look. And that's a larger cultural societal issue that we're talking about. We are, to, I mean, you and I are talking about this. This is significant. So that's the first thing is to not ignore it, not be afraid of it. I get um, even that encounter yesterday. So I don't know if I'm just like looking for these responses, but what I say, that that's what I'm talking about. Often to women around my age group, I get one of two responses. One is like, tell me more. The other one is just like, whoa, they recoil. Hmm. Like they, they, are, they do not want to be identified with that. And that's not going to help you age gracefully. That is not going to help you find what the hacks are. So that may seem really obvious, but if you refuse to talk about it or acknowledge it, and you also don't know where to go to get information, you're already in big trouble. So I'm happy to be out there. That's why I wrote the book. That's why I wrote the book. That's the most obvious one. The other ones are, a lot of them are really just the same ones that we talk about in general. And I do have a little thing that I like to call the science of self-care. I talk about, um, and I don't go into it really deeply in the book, but in a way, it's another way of looking at what I talk about. And I have these six S's, and these are the things we need to address for optimal health. And I think specifically as we're aging to look at those things. Okay. I always like to start with sex because I'm a gynecologist and also <laughs> sex. I mean, that's fun. It's fun. So we, we look at sex, sexual function. Sexual function can actually be a um, really important window into our health overall. We know that with men and women, things like erectile dysfunction, but also orgasmic dysfunction can be an early indicator of cardiovascular disease. And I'm going to interrupt to say something that I hear all the time from my patients. When I have a new patient and I'm taking their history, invariably they will say to me, well, so-and-so and so-and-so and so-and-so -and -so had diabetes, high blood pressure, strokes, heart attacks, but they were overweight. They were alcoholics. They were, okay. And these things we know are true. They're going to contribute to our risk. However, the number one killer of women is heart disease. Hmm. And there is some, we know we're going to hack. We know about epigenetics, but there are genetics. So again, if you don't understand that you, you can't just write this off and say like, grandpa was an alcoholic and obese. And that's not me. I don't do that. And no, I'm just going to go over here and be skinny fat. <laughs> that's not where it's at. So you, you do need to understand the, the, the bigger picture. Okay. So back to sex. 
Yeah, that makes sense. Well, well quick question. So <laughs> if as a, as a man, if you're having difficulty getting it up, right, yeah. that's a very conspicuous yeah. Uh, indicator of early of, right. of heart disease right. risk, right? Is right. there any is there any sort of analog for women? Because I know yeah. there's tissue sort of. It's a analog, little more right? complicated because or, uh, orgasmic dysfunction in women may not present the same way. And I think I, more often we're looking at the tissue changes, and those frequently are where the issues are lying for us in terms of pain, function. Uh, and desire. I mean, desire is a very complicated thing, but if you, it doesn't feel good, you're definitely not going to want to have sex. So, but there is some indication that when you're having decreased blood flow from loss of estrogen alone, that is going to indicate that you also are having some risk for cardiovascular disease, mm. which you have. I mean, when we go through menopause and even in perimenopause, our estrogen levels are waning or becoming less predictable. Uh, we start to approach the same kind of risks for heart disease as men do. Now, our heart disease tends to present differently. Um, men have more large vessel disease. Women have more microvascular disease. We have more, I mean, inflammation is a part of this for everybody, but it's more obviously attributed to inflammation. And I think that's why estrogen probably plays a role in our heart disease, loss of estrogen, and also estrogen replacement. So it's a little bit different, but I, that to me would be an early sign that you should be asking more deep questions. I mean, I, I would hate for people to wait till they're unable to have an orgasm to ask a question, but sometimes it takes something really difficult and painful, both physically and psychologically, for people to actually even talk about their problems or ask for help. So, okay, that's S number one. Hopefully with my, my brain fog, I won't forget all the rest of the S's. Um, <laughs> sleep, so, so, so important. Sleep is so, oh my God, it's so hard too. It's so hard because again, when you start getting into perimenopause and menopause, we're having changes in our sleep habits that are directly attributable to, to the changes in our hormones. But some of them are just hormones of aging, right? I mean, we know that melatonin production decreases. We know that vasopressin, which is literally the hormone that helps you depress the urge to pee. <laughs> and it's why people, one of the reasons why people wake up at night to pee to pee, like these are these are happening to men and women, and we don't have replacement for that. I mean, you can take melatonin. I wake up every night to pee. Every oh, night. Did you always do that? Is there a cure for that? I mean, it depends on what the issue is. Are you <laughs> drinking this huge <laughs> bottle of water? I mean, it's only. I five do. I like to but... drink water at night. I don't drink a ton of water at night. But, but... I, I have to tell you, as you age, and I don't know, I don't know how old you are. I'm gonna like guess. What would you guess? 32. <laughs> Sorry. Oh, <Aww>, blushing. <laughs> a prodigy. I just turned 40. I just turned okay, 40. Okay. So, but, but that's around the time when I think people start to notice some differences. Mm. I mean, I hate to say this too, like, it's like the antithesis of the book's message. Just wait. <laughs> 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 I mean, my partner is up like three times a night and he doesn't have prostate problems that we know about. Yeah. So I, some of it really is the vasopressin and it's so rough, man. I don't know what to say. Like I am, if I find the cure, I'm going to let you know. Can you just inject? Can I just take a shot of vasopressin? No, not right now. Oh man. I mean, there's probably somebody doing it, but I don't know that we have the science to support that. It's, it's honestly not that disru disruptive to me. I get, I wake up, I go pee, and I go get back right sleep. back to sleep. Most, I mean, most nights. I think most people know the worst thing you can do is to start engaging with some activity once you wake up. Like you really just have to get back in bed. And if you're having trouble, I don't think I'm going to say anything earth shattering here, whether it's get, you know, a meditation app, um, get a white noise machine, go out like the, your room, you know, sleep hygiene when you go to sleep is so important and people really have, they know it and they, they are not putting their devices down. No or their TV. No. They're just not doing it. I don't want to say like you got to do it. And then I think that there I talk a lot about botanicals. I have a background in herbal medicine and Ayurveda. I practice straight up conventional Beverly Hills gynecology, but I also am a secret herbalist. I'm That's not amazing. really a secret. And there are some good botanicals that I think have decent data to support their use. Um We've actually been growing medicinals in our backyard. That's one of our pandemic projects. And we just harvested our first valerian root, which is so cool because we grew it. Wow. And we made tea from it. And I'm not going to lie. I We made it. And then I was like, oh, my God, what if I kill us? <laughs> <laughs> but that's cool. Valerian root, I've always heard described as like nature's Valium or yeah. one of nature's yeah. Valiums. Yeah. It's actually, there's, listen, when you talk, you, you understand science literature, right? When you, you can't put an NIH study 
or a pharma study next to a botanical study and see the same kind of information. It's just not going to happen. And so let me just address that. I address it in the book, and I, I want to talk about that a little bit because to out of hand just reject everything that isn't like double blind placebo gold standard with 100,000 participants, you know, I think that's I think that's sad and I think we're missing out. And I think that there's enough data that is decent that has been vetted to make use of other medicines that are out there that have that are traditional, that are used in other cultures, that may have different profiles that are going to work differently. I mean, what most of our medicines, not most, a large number of our medicines, pharma medicines are actually plant-based. We took you know, the one little chemical purified it and amplified it. We're losing the entourage effect. I mean, this is the next book, so I should stop. But, um, <laughs> but, but there, so there's something to be said for that, but I do want to address the reality that like a lot of my conventional colleagues get very uncomfortable with botanicals and herbals because the data is just not as robust. And also they're not, they're not trained in it. So they don't have a level of comfort, but I do think that there are some botanicals out there that can be helpful for sleep. Valerian is one I like. Melatonin, I'm a big fan of. Mm. Um, I like a lot of the so-called adaptogens, um, ashwagandha, rhodiola. And I do think that that's something that people can be looking at because they can be safer for some people. You have to be very careful about what other meds you might be taking. You have to be careful about where you're getting them. Mm. They're not regulated the same way. The FDA with all its problems, does have a pretty good system to make sure we're getting safe, efficacious medications. Botanicals are regulated by Deshay, very different regulatory body, less um, meticulous. So I want to just put that warning on that. But I think, again, looking at sleep habits and looking at other ways to get sleep are important. I think the other thing, too, is there is increasing, this is more like the evolutionary biology thing, like some of this is also the way we live. There is some some information that indicates that like in the olden times, there were people who like people went to sleep early, right? Maybe you had a candle. You certainly didn't have electricity. You went to sleep when it got dark. Maybe you woke up in the middle of the night and you did some stuff and then you went back to sleep again. Hmm. And we don't live that way. So some of this is also a problem of evolution. Like we have evolved a societal structure more rapidly than our bodies have evolved to keep pace with oh, those things. Definitely. I mean, look at the technology. Yeah. I mean, modern life is, is so asynchronous with regard to our Very circadian much. rhythms, you know? Yeah. And get, and that's, so that's the thing in a way, these S's are really just about plugging back into yourself, mm. not dissociating. We do a lot of dissociating during the course of our lives. It gets us where we need to go. It's really not healthy. Yeah. It's not healthy physically. It's not healthy mentally. It's not healthy spiritually. Um, and the rest of my S's are kind of related to that. So I have one called sustenance, which is really both what we're taking in orally food and movement. I like to put those together. I mean, again, these are things that I think most of us know. But we have got to continue to have some kind of movement routine. And if we haven't been doing a movement routine, you are actually the lucky ones because all you have to do is start doing that. Mm. If you've been sitting on your butt for 20 years and you get up and walk, oh my God. Game changer. Total game changer. And now there's more, we, you know, we knew this already, but there's more published data on insulin resistance and glucose metabolism with just short walks, a short walk after a meal. I learned that in residency. With wow. gestational diabetes. Hmm. We would always tell people who had gestational diabetes, take a walk after your meal. Huge, huge impact. This is not, you know, you have to have a lot of money and join a fancy gym. Right. This is literally getting off your ass. Do you tend to, do you recommend weight training, resistance yes. training? So that was the other thing. As Especially women as we age, we have to get resistance training in there. We have to be lifting weights or doing some kind of resistance work because we need to build lean body mass and we need to strengthen our bones. Um, I think the other thing is like, I have been a fitness person for my entire adult life. I can't go hard in the way that I used to because I'm like a, I'm a crazy person. I'm competitive. I didn't like end up doing what I'm doing because I'm so chill. <laughs> I would love to, I mean, I'm kind of chill. I'm pretty chill. You're pretty chill. But I mean, not really. So I've had to learn to back off because this is how you injure yourself. You need to have active recovery, but you have got to lift heavy stuff. Do it carefully. Do it with someone you know, or who knows what they're doing. 
Um, and especially for women, it is so important because we're losing the muscles. And it's important for our metabolic rate. It's important to help keep our heart healthy, but it's also really important for balance, for flexibility, for strength. You don't want to have that fall. Or if you have that fall, you want to know how to break that fall carefully without breaking a hip. Like, you know, these are things we have to think about. Hips, yeah. You know, a hip fracture is like ha your mortality in the two years following a hip fracture is like 50% higher or something. Yeah. It's, it's really for real. I mean, my most sort of intimate uh, relationship with aging is was watching my mom age. Mm -hmm. And my experience of seeing her go through menopause and, uh, and, and issues related to bone mineral density and all the things that like come up, you know, as yeah. a, as an aging woman yeah. that I would hear just through osmosis living in the same house yeah. with her growing up for bone health, at least her generation, you just get thrown like a calcium supplement and you're like, good luck. You know, they're like, good luck. But now we know that actually, as you mentioned, weight training is one of the best things that you could do for bone yeah. health. Right. And even, and calcium supplements are, correct me if I'm wrong. They're not they're Miss, not the be all and end all. They're not the be all and end all, but aren't they also even like associated with like cardiovascular risk? Yeah. I mean, you have to be really careful. This is what I call whiplash medicine. Like if you start, if you think as a lay person that you need to change your practices based on whatever the latest study that got, you know, into the news cycle, uh, that's going to be dangerous. And I think we really can't practice that way either. It's, it's a weird tension, honestly, Max, because on the one hand, medicine is very conservative by nature for things like that, right? If you see one study and it's super sexy, like, are we really going to change all of our practices? On the other hand, because we are so slow to change, we really miss out on opportunities. We miss out on cutting edge opportunities. We're skeptical. We don't want to accept something different or new. The calcium thing, I think, um, yeah, calcium without magnesium is not really necessarily your friend. And overdoing it, like just chomping on calcium is not it. Like you need to be able to absorb the calcium. So it's so comp, like how's your mi gut microbiome? How's your digestion? What else are, what are you eating? You're going to, bioavailability is a huge thing. Like cal calcium, there's more calcium in almonds than there is in dairy. Mm. People don't under, in dark green leafy vegetables, which also, hello, entourage effect, right? Has magnesium as well. Oh yeah. Has K, like, okay. Has zinc, has K2. Like there's other things happening there and we don't always appreciate and understand the depth of nutritional medicine, which is another big issue that I think we have in medicine in general. Um, yeah, you actually recommend vitamin D supplements yes. in your book. And, uh, and you mentioned vitamin K2. Vitamin yeah. K2 is this, li this little known variant of vitamin K, right. which activates osteoblasts. Right. Right, which right. are like the bone right. building right. proteins. Right, exactly. You're not really gonna. Here's the thing: you're gonna you're gonna do some bone remodeling. You're not gonna build a lot of bone after your 30s. Actually, you just wanna. The problem is the osteoclasts, which are the guys that are literally eating bone um, and thinning your bone out. I'm trying to make this sound like normal English. Um, they are out, their activities outstripping osteoblast activity. So there's always um, sort of a give and take in all of our body processes. And that's what homeostasis is, right? A, a point of balance, so to speak. It's not really what it is, but it, it's the best way to, I think, describe it. And you're hundred percent right. We, if we don't understand all of the intricacies of how these, these things work together, then we're not going to really fully appreciate w also what we can accomplish. Because again, if it's like, you know, look, if I have five minutes to talk to somebody and get through all the important stuff, I, so I wrote the book too. Like I can't even, like I can't. It's a lot. <laughs> this is 300 pages. Yeah. This. I can't do this in a two minute encounter. And, and also I've spent a lot of time like reading this stuff and working on it. I just was more interested in it. And, and um, so, yeah, so, so I think understanding, like I do have sort of the key supplements that I like people to look at and they are magnesium, omega threes. Um, and these are also because they have good scientific data to support their use. Uh, D3, those are kind of my top ones. And then I think I, I, I do want to also touch on hormones. I think hormones have really gotten a bad name and it's unfortunate. That's a long, sad story. Mm. It's an interesting story depending on your perspective. But I think people are, Again, I see a big split. I see people thinking hormones are going to be a panacea and fix everything and they're not going to age and they're going to be able to look like they're 
27 and act like they're 27 for whatever it's worth. And other people who are so scared, it's going to give me cancer. It's going to kill me. My mom had cancer, my grandma, whatever it is. And it's really not accurate. It's largely a reflection of a very, very large study that was published in the early 2000s, the Women's Health Initiative. Amazing in many ways. NIH funded a billion dollars, over 120,000 subjects, but they really got it wrong. Mm. And, you know, it made a big splash. The problem was they weren't really looking at the menopausal transition. When we drilled down and looked at who was in this study, the average age of the study participant was 62, 63. Many, like a, like two thirds had, were obese or overweight, had heart disease already. Well, mm. you know, they had heart attacks. Was that the estrogen and the progesterone? And it wasn't progesterone, it was progestin. No, they had risk factors. This is not a 51 year old making a transition. You just, you can't translate, you can't, you can't apply or generalize that data from one group to another. They're not the same group of people. Mm. And there was, there's a lot of politics around this that I don't want to waste time on. It's, I mean, it's interesting. Avram Blooming talks a lot about it in his book, um, Estrogen Matters. It's fascinating. It's terrible and sad. Mm. But what came away was a generation of women who were told, this is going to kill you. Doctors that got scared. And we've been walking it back for 20 years. Wow. So you're yeah. a fan of HRT pretty much. I am for the right person. Mm. And I, I'm, you know, under, yeah, for the right person. And I got to tell you, I'm starting to look, it, it's interesting. I wrote the book, I published the book, and I'm looking more deeply into some of the more controversial aspects now. We'll leave that part alone. I'm a breast cancer survivor myself. I don't use uh, systemic hormones, um, which is another reason why I'm like so lifestyle-y, which is funny because I was anyways. And I remember thinking in my 40s, um, God, am I going to like, I'm Ayur, like, I'm Mrs. Ayurveda. <laughs> am I going to put my money where my mouth is? And then I got breast cancer and I was like, well, I guess so. Wow. <laughs> so there you go. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Which is fine. Wow. And, uh, so what's, so then what's the, um, what are sort of like natural means of optimizing our hormones? Well, I mean, it's not so necessarily optimizing the hormones. We don't, we can't say for sure that that's what's happening. The natural means would be it depends. There's a couple of things. There's the fitness portion, the tr nutrition portion. There's also the symptom area. So when we look at the most notable symptoms, the symptoms that really drive people coming in to see me or drive people Googling this stuff, yeah, it's you know the stuff you probably saw with your mom, right? It's the hot flashes. It's the lack of sleep. That's way more than just like getting up to pee once. Yeah. It's the brain fog. Well, why don't, why don't you break down what actually happens in the body? Cause I mean, many of my listeners yeah. are female, some are men, but we all have relationships with women. Right. right? So, right. Right. Yeah, so what's actually happening in the okay. body? So this menopause? is what's going on in menopause. First of all, let me give you the definition. Menopause is not a disease. <laughs> it's a natural condition. It is retrospective. So you're not going to know until you're there. 12 months consecutively over the age of 45 without a menstrual cycle, okay, for no other medical reason. Obviously, this leaves out people who had a hysterectomy or something, right? So we're not, we're not going to talk about all the special cases. But that's menopause. Now, the transition up to menopause, or some people call perimenopause, can be for up to a decade. And during that time, what's happening is the ovarian hormones that are being produced on a regular basis are being produced at a, at a different level and a different amount. So hormones are just chemical messengers. They're just, they're, they're like how our body is talking to itself. The brain and the ovary and the uterus and other parts are, are constantly in conversation. And with estrogen specifically, you know, we have estrogen receptors throughout our bodies, everywhere, bone, brain, vaginal tissue, like it's everywhere. So heart, so what's happening is the brain is signaling to the ovary, hey, you know, you should probably get ready to make an egg and release that egg. And we're going to call that ovulation. And that's in the middle of the menstrual cycle. The cycle is the entire month. We're going to release that egg when that egg does not get hooked up literally with somebody and doesn't get a conception going. The hormones are going to convert. So initially, the ovary is making progesterone to support the potential pregnancy. When that doesn't happen, those hormones all drop off. The lining of the uterus has been built up in response to estrogen that sheds and the whole thing starts over. So for people who menstruate, that's a very, that's a very important part of how we feel in our bodies. That's a rhythm that we are 
living by that we understand our moods, our energy levels, um, our weight, you know, how we feel in clothing, how we feel as a person. It's really like driving a lot of us for a long period of our life in that perimenopausal transition. The eggs are both running out, so to speak, and their quality is different and the communication lines change. And so, you know, the brain is sort of normally whispering, hey, time to do the thing. And then it starts to be like push, nudging, getting a little louder. And now it's screaming at you. And literally that, that hormone, FSH, follicle stimulating hormone, rises during that time. So it has an inverse relationship. The higher it gets, the harder it is trying to get the ovary to do its thing and make that, that estrogen. This is complicated. It's kind of like TSH, right? Like yeah, thyroid 100%. stimulating it's, hormone. Yeah, and they come from their neighbors. Hmm. They come from the same region of the brain. Oh, the interesting. anterior pituitary. Yeah, that's and the hypothalamic. I mean, it's like, you know, it's a whole, there's like a lot of, there's a lot of stuff going on in there. It's crazy. Yeah. So that relationship starts to change. The because the progesterone in the second half of your cycle is also being driven by that whole ovarian function, <clears throat> the progesterone drops too. And this is where people start getting symptoms, right? So a lot of the symptoms people are getting are not just from the decline in the estrogen, but also the decline in the progesterone. I didn't even talk about testosterone. That's declining too. I, this is too much. And women. Be, yeah. Hmm. And actually, we have more testosterone present than estrogen present when we're young. We don't have more testosterone than men. Right. But the dominant hormone is testosterone in our body, which is really interesting. So and that's being made both in the adrenals and other places. So, it, I mean, this would be a 10 hour this would be medical school <laughs> medical we're not school. gonna do that yeah i mean so so but that so i that's, would i would i know you no, would probably. you're like i'm like is he just being nice or is he actually into this um super <laughs> so that's that's what's happening and eventually the estrogen the the follicle stops making uh, uh an ovulatory follicle you stop releasing an egg you stop making the estrogen the progesterone also goes away so what are the resulting symptoms that we have Everybody doesn't have them, by the way. Also, why do we not know this? I mean, that's odd. Good question. So, well, menopause is different, woman to woman. Yeah. The symptoms. Yeah, I mean, I mean, there are like symptoms that a lot of people have, and like eighty-five percent of people have hot flashes, but fifteen percent don't. Interesting. You know, I know, right? So, hot flashes are resulting mostly from this drop in estrogen. Um, the mood changes are both, but I, I think I see most in perimenopause. It's really more related to progesterone. I'm going to leave it there in the mm -hmm. beginning. Um, because it's almost like this extended PMS you're getting the lack of sleep. Sometimes the lack of sleep is just lack of sleep. Sometimes the lack of sleep is from hot flashes. What do now, hot flashes feel like? They literally feel like, like if you were in your house today and you just did not put the AC on and you just start, but it, it's actually kind of from the inside out. It's very hard to, what did somebody say to me the other day? I mean, I've heard them all. My own personal summer. That's one. <laughs> <laughs> My own personal summer. Yeah. <laughs> Can I share a funny observation yeah. I made about, about the galley yeah. of your book? Yeah. When you describe for the first time what a hot flash feels like, yeah. <laughs> you quote a man. Oh, did I? <laughs> yeah. I'm like, you couldn't find a female MD? To describe that? How's he that. supposed to know? Like, read it to me. <laughs> yeah, I, here it is. Here it is. You know, you turn these books in and then yeah. that's it. According to Dr. Robert Friedman at yeah. Wayne State University School of Medicine, <laughs> a hot flash is, quote, a rapid and exaggerated heat dissipation response consisting of profuse sweating, peripheral vasodilation, and feelings of intense internal heat. In other words, holy Scottsdale in August, it's hot in here. Yeah. Well, I wanted to let the men be in the book too. <laughs> <laughs> very inclusive, very inclusive. Very but, I thought, inclusive. but I thought it was funny. Like a guy's never going to know what that feels like. I know. It's a good description though. That's why I used it. Yeah. So, so it matches. Listen, shout out to him. Shout out to him. Yeah. I guess <laughs> you're you, right. Thank you, Doc. Yeah. That's cool. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So they're not fun, basically. No, they're not that fun. How long do they last? I mean, to, uh, up when you're getting into menopause, two to 10 years, but there are people, usually the most intense part is about four to six years around that transition. And, and that includes like the, you know, afterward, like the last couple of years after you're done there, there's probably about less than 10% in their seventies still have an occasional hot flash. I mean, most people are not having like intense, repetitive, persistent, disruptive hot flashes as they get out of menopause. But there are people who can have severe, Veer, I mean, 30, 40 a day. Wow. And interestingly, we call these vasomotor symptoms. These are also another indicator 
of cardiovascular health. So people who have more intense, persistent hot flashes may have more risk for cardiovascular disease. Interesting. Yeah. 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 And for some people, it'll feel like anxiety too, which is confusing because there is more anxiety and panic noted. And people who have had a history of mood disorders tend to have a recurrence of mood disorders around this time again. It's really intense. People will describe just like panic and anxiety. Like I never had panic attacks. I'm just not that. I'm a surgeon. Okay. Like it's kind of hard to scare me. (laughs) (laughs) I had horrible panic and anxiety for a little period of time around there. It was, you really feel out of body. It's a mess. Like it's, and if you don't know where to turn, it can be so isolating and so scary. Hmm. So, you know, these are, these are things that are, if we're talking about them, we're going to normalize it and then we're going to have solutions. You know, yeah. So that's kind of the the science behind that part of it. You recommend drinking ice cold water. Yeah. Is that effective? One hundred percent. Wow. Yeah. I mean, look, you got to do what you can do. I know people who have crazy expensive like cooling blanket systems. To me, I'm like, wow, that's. I just can't go there. I don't know. <laughs> that's not what I want to do. But I I have friends who swear by it. Um, and like a lot of devices, there are like some interesting wearables that can be helpful. Um, I personally just, I, I'm like an herb person. So that's what I've tended to use the most, but ice water absolutely will work, especially if you're like in a situation, right? Like let's say you're at work or you're giving a talk. Cause it's always going to be when you're <laughs> doing something yeah. public, like if you have the ice water, it really, it's literally going to cool you down. Yeah. I know. Love that. It's very easy. Simple, mm-hmm. simple fix. With, Everything with doesn't have to be fancy. Big wins. Mm-hmm. Okay. So in terms of the S's, are there any others that you want to oh, share? Yeah, we covered more. sex, sleep, sustenance. Okay. Uh, senses, senses. What you're taking in, what you're taking in. And I mean that in every possible way. So we talked about food and, and you know, herbs and meds and stuff, but wh- what are, who are you surrounding yourself with? You know, like what activities do you do? What are you actually looking at? What are you consuming as a consumer? Like, what are you reading? What are you watching? What are you smelling? The olfactory bulb is the closest contact between the outside world and your brain. It is literally a little piece of your brain sticking into your nose. So you should think about what you're smelling. Like if your fragrances and aromas and stuff, that's powerful. That's that's actually powerful medicine. There's interesting data on that too. So senses, um, social connection, I think. Anybody who's lived through the last two and a half years could easily tell you without a study that (laughs) our sense of community and our sense of capacity to be around others is enormously impactful on our mental health and our physical health. Um, And then the last one is spirituality. Having some kind of a spiritual practice, whatever it is of your choosing, you are a religion person and you like organized religion and that gives you joy and hope and a bigger picture you like to call it a higher power, you meditate, you do yoga, you're, you know, a total atheist, but you believe in nature, whatever it is, I think connecting with something bigger than yourself, something that is outside of you, that is a driving force is very, very important. And again, I, all of these, there's data to support all of this. I'm, I'm a very, I'm, I'm a very spiritual person, but I'm, I like science too. I don't feel like everything has to be proven to be perfectly honest with you. I mean, do we really have to prove that, you know, meditating helps? We, we do. We have tons of data. Yeah. 1970s, Herbert Benson. Yeah. My boy, Harvard. Love that guy. I like to say that I'm my approach and feel free to feel free to borrow this, but it's evidence based, but not evidence bound. Love that. Oh my God. I, that I'm going to, that's, my, use that's it. me. I'm, using, me. I'm totally. Use it. <laughs> Yeah. Going to, no, get a tattoo. I, I think that that's that's a great way to approach this stuff because obviously obviously evidence is important right right but it changes too yeah all the time right and, and when we make a limited. religion out of it right and how many decisions do you make on a day-to-day basis that are not data-driven right, right? like data right. is not the end-all be-all right. right we're human beings yeah and also as an expert and as a clinician your experience also matters and sometimes that totally. is that can be underappreciated right like, uh, like anecdotes are a form of data if you're mm-hmm. trained in a way to be able to, you know. Right. You can, I mean, listen, it's sometimes it's hard. Writing the book was such an interesting experience. And I worked with an amazing writer because I am a full-time clinician. I love writing, but like there was only so much I was going to be able to do. That was so interesting for me because so much of what I do is just imprinted. Like I have algorithms <laughs> that I'm running all the time unconsciously. 
And I did this also because in the last two years I was working with a startup and a lot of what we did was like, take my brain algorithms and map them into UX, you know, mm. to, to help with clinical, um, protocols. And that was so interesting, but also kind of weird because it, it speaks to what you're saying. Like I've been in practice for 22 years. There are a lot of things that are just like automatic that are based. Could I say they were all data driven? No. Like I know what I'm doing. I know I know what I'm doing. You know, could I always, could I explain it to you always? No, <laughs> but yeah. I was forced to. <laughs> yeah. There's just, there's, there's just so much uncertainty too, especially in these really important needle movers like nutrition, right? Like, yeah. like something like nutrition is, it's much less well-funded than drug research right. and it's much more complicated. Yep. So, right. Like with drug research, you're, everybody like starts at zero exposure to a drug, right? right? You give them a drug right. and then you see what the outcome is, you know, depending on like what you're looking for. But nutrition, like everybody's starting at different levels, like of of exposure to various nutrients and things like that. And um, there's not single compounds in the foods that are usually given, right? There's like right. innumerable compounds. And that's why food. people people get like upset about some of this. And it's like, well, but that's not really how life works or the body works. Or like, I just give you like a tiny little peek into hormones and menstrual cycles. It's so complicated. And I still believe that science could do much better when they, it, when it, in terms of addressing women. I mean, it's just mind boggling how little has been addressed, but it is complex. And so I do understand why it's hard to apply, you know, the Western conventional empiric scientific inquiry model to something that is so uh, complicated and mm. ever moving and changing. You know, we all have circadian rhythms, plus now we add on to that a menstrual cycle. And, you know, I guess that's too hard. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I, I have some thoughts about that, huh. but apparently that's too hard. <laughs> well, I mean, there's so much good stuff in your, in your book. People should definitely, definitely check it out. But let's talk about, because um, we've, we've touched briefly on nutrition. How, and that's, you know, obviously something that, that I'm right. super interested in. So how can women support themselves nutritionally? through this. Yeah. I, I think being a lot more mindful and intentional in their eating, I, this is a, a really, really important conversation because it does again. And I always love these, these messy things. I think it, it's the convergence of both science, aging, changing body, changing needs, changing nutritional needs, changing exercise needs and culture. And to expect us to come into this part of our lives, not impacted by diet culture, by beauty culture, by misogyny, by ageism. I tell everybody menopause is the sad stepchild. <laughs> it should, or it has been of, you know, misogyny <laughs> and mm. ageism. It's like, I, I want, I'm, I've adopted her and she's amazing and <laughs> people are silly, but that's what happens. It gets ignored. And I think if you think you're going to come into your late forties, and not be affected by the muffin top that you never had, that's ridiculous. And it's unfair to ask people to not have a feeling about that. Um, now, to say, like, I am going to wave this magic wand, you're going to go on hormones, you're going to eat more protein, because that's a big one, eat more protein. Um, look at your portion size, look at when you eat and how you eat, and look at the order in which you're eating it. Then add in your routine, your movement routine, um, you can do those things. I do those things. Uh, and, and they, they really do work, but to think that you're going to head into that and you're going to now be where you wanted to be, or you never even got when you were 27, I'm going to use 27 again, is not fair. And it's not true. I think we have to learn how to be in the body we have, optimize our health and love ourselves. Cause if we don't like ourselves, I mean, really don't, who do you think is going to like you? Like, exactly. that's not cool. And it's definitely not sexy. So I, I've learned a lot by my studies. I also have my partner. My life partner is a 35 year fitness pro. So I'm very, I, I'm lucky. I'm lucky. I'm today. We're going to say I'm lucky <laughs> <laughs> because you know, <laughs> the first date he was like, I'm not the food police. <laughs> I said, sure, sure. You're not. So, but I actually listened to him. <laughs> wow. Love and that. yeah. And I mean, after a long time, it took me a long time to listen <laughs> to him, but it's true. You know, I looked at like, He's way bigger than me. And like what my plate does not need to be as big as his. I'm not restricting. I don't need to eat that much. You know, like 
do I want to live in a world where I never have a glass of wine or I never have a piece of cake? No, right. that's ridiculous. Do I need to have that all the time? No, I don't. Like my body doesn't feel great when I do that. Yeah. So protein, protein, protein. I think um, you can't underestimate that. And especially again, we were, we were talking about aging bodies and building lean body mass. You need the building blocks. You need the protein. You have to. Yeah. You have to do it. We've had a lot of uh, like really um, brilliant protein experts on the podcast and they talk about anabolic resistance, which is something that we experience as we get older. Yeah. I was listening to somebody because I was like, I want to hear what your podcast was. Yeah. And I was like, oh, I like that guy. Well, yeah. you're basically just you're underscoring, yeah, the value of protein, particularly mm -hmm. as you get older, and, and things particularly start with women breaking down. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think people need to be less afraid. I mean, I want to honor whatever eating style you feel fits your life best. I mean, yeah, we have the blue zones and we have Mediterranean. I'm not against plant based. I do think we need to have a lot more plants in our diet than we do in the the standard Western diet. Of course, whole plants. A hundred percent. Yeah, exactly. Not like not plant based junk food i'm not a huge fan of that either yeah. like i oh god this is like a hole am i gonna step in this but you know because because <laughs> step you're, <in> it. <laughs> you're a bad I do. influence i mean All here's, the time. here's the thing i have a lot of vegan friends and vegan people in my life and stuff and i i just like i get where they're coming from in a lot of ways but i just I personally can't do it. I don't, I don't tolerate that diet. Now, here's where my Ayurveda comes in. But you do in. promote plant, like a plant-forward diet. 100%. Yeah. Plants are amazing. Right. They have so many things in there without stripping them out. And like, also fiber is super important. We have to. Right? And we know with prebiotics, like if you don't, like we can talk about the microbiome and you can dip yourself in a pool of probiotics, okay? However, it's not going to do shit <laughs> if you don't feed those little guys some food. 100%. They need the fiber. I mean, we need the fiber. Fiber is, if you don't want to get colon cancer, if you, and also there's a lot of data on breast cancer too. I mean, this is so, this is where I get like eh, geeky. Insulin resistance, breast cancer, like these things are all related. So fiber is incredibly important for reducing the risk of all of those things. What's the mechanism? Like what is the relationship between dietary fiber and estrogen? Um, I don't know if we know exactly. There's probably somebody smarter who does. There is, part of it has to do with the metabolic pathway because when we say estrogen, we're really being simplistic here. There are mm. multiple forms of estrogen. So the estrogen that we're making in our own body and any estrogen that's coming into our body is going to get processed in the liver if we're eating it orally. And it's going to get, we have different metabolic pathways that actually are genetic in origin. Some of us are going to make more estrone, um, some estradiol, some estriol. Estriol is really more of a pregnancy uh, est estrogen. But the way we are dumping it is through the gut. And so my understanding is that the fiber is a very important means of, just like with cholesterol, right? Yeah. Because estrogen is a steroid. It's a, um, it's a steroid hormone. It's a steroid sex hormone. So it is made from cholesterol. So it's similar to the way we're dumping and removing a lot of other fat-based products from our body. It's complicated too, though, because right if we don't have the right microbiome, we're not going to absorb the same way. And that's everything. That's everything from your K2 and your vitamin D, which is, you know, uh, oil soluble, fat soluble to the magnesium. Like you need to have the right amount of cofactors in there to bring these important workers into your cells. It's not just like getting in. That's why blood testing Oh God, Suzanne, stop. Um, <laughs> but like I, I'm it. not like against it. blood testing, I'm, by the way, but that's why blood testing is a little weird sometimes because it's not necessarily going to tell you what's in the cells. Hmm. Interesting. That's a whole other conversation. Well, so I guess with like magnesium, there's not really a good blood test to, to determine magnesium not status. Not that I'm aware of. Yeah. Yeah. So I'm assuming there's other... other. I But there's a big difference too between bench science, like what's available in the lab experimentally and what's available clinically. Like that's the other thing. I think when people like do their own research and they're Googling stuff, like God bless them, do it. It's confusing to me. And I have an, an MD and I've been doing this for over 20 years. You got to really be careful. Some of this data, and I think some of this leaks out into the influencer world and stuff like that. And like the science and even the plant-based community, sometimes they're using data that is not always clinical or, you know, it's in vivo, it's in vitro, it's in the lab. And like, there's theoretical issues there to be unpacked. And that's true in my world too, in plant-based medicine or in plant medicine and in 
herbal medicine and functional medicine. I'm not really a functional medicine person, but like I, at the skirts of that, I'm interested in it. I think anytime, again, anytime we do like evidence-based versus evidence-bound, like what is that evidence? What is that evidence? Is that, was that evidence that was derived from a clinical study, which then is confusing too? Yeah. And we could fight endlessly about this stuff. At the end of the day, like, let's try to use our common sense. Let's try to take care of ourselves. Let's try not to be so mean to each other. <laughs> yeah. Really? People get very mad about this, talking about this stuff. You have to deal with it too. It's all like, the time. It's this way right. only, and uh, you're wrong. In nutrition? Okay. Oh, my God. All the time. So triggered. Common sense, ironically, is not that common these days. No, apparently not. Apparently not. <laughs> One of the things I love about your book is that um, in the back you go into uh, brain health. You go into dementia, yeah, yeah. and, and um, you Ugh. talk about the the Lancet report uh, that um, found that forty percent. I believe it's at least forty yeah. percent, but they wrote forty percent of of dementia cases are preventable, attributable to modifiable risk factors, and yeah. then you list out the. Yeah. The risk factors. Yeah. Then you cite Lisa Moscone. Oh my God, such a big fan of hers. Yeah. She's, she's doing great. really important work. But the other thing to note, you know, when I started looking again at the Women's Health Initiative and like, why did we get so flipped out? A lot of the data that's happening now is way more sophisticated than what was going on in the 90s. But we were already understanding that estrogen, oh my God, this is killing me right now. Sorry. <laughs> Whatever with my hair. Um, a lot. <laughs> Sorry, we had a little moment. Um, a lot of the data in the 90s was already indicating that estrogen therapy was beneficial to brain function. And, and if you just look again, dialing it back and looking at clinical data, women may not realize this, your male listeners may not listen to this, know this either, but women, once they get into menopause, are two to three, two to three the times more likely to experience dementia and Alzheimer's than men. Yeah. Which is really enormous and scary. Yeah. And but the irony is that estrogen is normally protective. Correct. So what is the rub then? Like where where, where do things go wrong? In terms of estrogen and well, if estrogen and, is normally protective, why is it that women are at two times the risk? In menopause, they are because they've lost their estrogen. So it's just like the rug is being pulled out yeah. in menopause because men have estrogen. Yeah. As well. Of so course. is it is it that it drops lower than men's, and that's where sort of men. I don't know. That's a great question. I think it's more that we get, yeah, you're right. Cause with heart disease it's more like now we drop down to the baseline and we're like you guys. Um, I, that's a great question that I mm. do not have an answer for. Interesting. But it's yeah. just like it, the change, the mm -hmm. shift is mm -hmm. probably what changes. Them. Well, exactly. And, and estrogen is interesting because it's pro-inflammatory in some ways. We know this, right? Because it can increase blood clotting for instance, but it's anti-inflammatory in other ways. And this is also where we look at like Estr beta estradiol, alpha estradiol, you know, like the, <laughs> what receptors are in the intima, which is the inside part of your blood vessels versus in, you know, the glial cells. I mean, so th it's very complex. I mean, I think Lisa's, Lisa Moscone's work is so important because she's also looking at like functional studies, functional MRIs, and um, we're really just scratching the surface, but it's very, it's very exciting. Again, a lot of the lifestyle stuff we talked about though can be really beneficial Exercise, 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 exercise. If you put blood into the parts of your body that need it, guess what? Good things happen. Good things happen. Oxygen gets there. Nutrition gets there. Flexibility gets there. We need that. So I don't want people to feel like, oh, my God, I have to be on estrogen. I mean, I probably am not going to take estrogen. So either someone's going to be taking care of me. That's not funny. Well, there's also you know, like different or, forms of there's like oral estrogen, as you 100%. mentioned. There's like whatever topical yes yeah right yeah yeah i'm not a humongous fan of oral estrogen i no. think you get a lot of the pro-inflammatory and the gut like you have to process it through the liver unnecessary i just think you're gonna i prefer transdermal um fda approves wonderful bioidenticals that are pharmaceutical grade and highly vetted and they are transdermal that's the other thing people think bioidentical means natural and think it's weird or it has to come from a compounding pharmacy or you had a spit in a cup and pee on the thing and go there every three months and get a pellet in your ass and spend $7,000. And it's like, no, 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 no. You can come to me and we can write a prescription for bioidentical, very wonderful, safe hormones. Hmm. So I, I do tend to like estrogen through the skin and progesterone orally. I think it's absorbed better. Don't they get pro progesterone from like horses or something? Um, that was Premarin, oh, which, okay. was, which was a, an estrogen product from, yeah, pregnant horses, 
Interesting. Hammer. Oh Get yeah, it? there you Get go. It? Yeah, Cute. it's kind of gross. Mm. Kind of gross. What's yeah. like? What's what? What would you say is like one thing that you wish everybody knew about menopause that they don't currently? I I wish everybody knew that it's not so horrible. It's not so horrible. No, it's really not so horrible at all. Like I'm I'm having an awesome time. <laughs> I am. Well, you're following your recommendations. I'm sure. You're I'm trying to. I mean, I'm you know I don't do all of it every day. <laughs> But I do. And I also have always been focused on this kind of stuff. So, you know, to me, menopause is amazing in so many ways. Like it is a great unveiling. There's a lot of stuff that you aren't doing anymore. Your body's not doing anymore. And it sort of relieves you of certain things that, that maybe weren't working so well for you. People talk about, I don't know, come on, I swear. I've already yeah, sworn, haven't yeah, I? Yeah, okay. Go for it. Um, people talk about the no fucks to give fifties. It's very <laughs> true. Cause you're like, whatever. <laughs> like really, it's interesting. Some of I, and I, some of it's cultural. I think you're like, okay, I can't make your baby. Bye. <laughs> I'll be over here. <laughs> you know, like, it's just like, I'm boiling it down and I'm being silly, but there is something really, really, uh, enormously liberating. It's a massive time of creativity for a lot of people. Um, they get to focus on who they are, what they want. It's, to me, it has been awesome. And I want people to feel excited about it, not scared of it. Also, we're not scary. No. We're here to help. Any, what are like some of your favorite, this is going to sound like a random question, but like any good, like, like some of your favorite films about this topic or like TV, you know, Ooh. cause I know that that I haven't seen it, but like the new sex in the city just came out. My mind went there, but it's, I don't know if it's good. I, or you know, like I didn't that, really like, watch it and I had like mixed feelings about it, but I wasn't a sex in the city watcher the first time around either. Cause I think I was like in medical school or having babies or something like that. So I was sort of like not watching TV. Um, I think it's interesting. I think it's, uh, I, I'm going to fill ill on this one. Cause I'm like watching a lot of, um, old person TV. <laughs> Like SVU. <laughs> SVU. <laughs> I just outed myself. I mean, the flea bag, the scene in flea bag, which but, everybody has seen. Wait, where they I talk seen about it. oh, it's great. Huh. It's great. There's a scene, there's a conversation about menopause. And basically she kind of says what I say, which is like, it's awesome. Like you think it's going over here and then it's going over there. I think that is a great depiction. I actually I lied. Hands down, one of my favorite depictions is better things. My friend Pamela Adlon, who is a genius. This show is so real and so great. And I don't think you need to be a woman of a certain age to appreciate it, but it's an amazing depiction of a human Yeah, in all of her glory and all of the discomfort and this, her specific situation, that character's specific situation. That is a great one. If you haven't watched it, watch it. It's, it's a fantastic show. That's great. I mean, we yeah. need more representation of women. Yeah. Over 40, especially like yeah. women that are that are happy and that are like sexy. Yeah. Right. And, or that are just living, that are real. Like yeah. the other part of it, and I think some of my issues initially with the Sex and the City reboot was like, and I mean to be okay, so there was a meme going around showing the Golden Girls and Sex and the City. And I was like, first of all, how are you ragging on the Golden Girls? Who are you? Like they're the most amazing ever. Yeah. But did they look like your grandma? Yeah. And it's it is wild. It's like oh, that's what fifty three was in the whatever year that was, and now these you know people are being depicted in a very different way. Now, I mean, honestly, do I look probably more like the Sex and the City people? Yeah. But in a way, I also was like, why are we crapping on people looking like old ladies? Like if they want to look like an old lady, they should go do that. But that was me being kind of contrarian. Do you know uh, Judy Greer, the actress? Yes. She's been yes, on the yes, podcast yeah. and she uh, she's super passionate about this topic. You should connect oh, with her. Oh, I would yeah. love to. Yeah. I would love to. She's an incredible. Oh, thank you. I'd love to. I'm going to check it out. Yeah, yeah, she's awesome. She has like a supplement company now aimed towards women over, over the there's age of 40. A lot of, there's a lot of activity out there. And I yeah. think it's really interesting. I think what I saw quoted is that, you know, and this is very like American capitalist, right? But it's like a $400 million a year industry, which is growing, growing because every, like, I think it's the, the quote, the, the, the uh, data is like 6,000 women a day are entering menopause. And like you said, we're going to spend a very large part of our lives in menopause. And I think we've been kind of like over here ignored. And it's ridiculous. Like we're here, we want and need all the same things and we need support and we need better help and better ways to address 
how we're feeling and how we want to enter into that next phase. And so I'm of the mind, I know some people are really critical, like we're commodifying this. And I, I just like, I don't, I think we have to give people more credit than that. And I think we have to give people more options than they have. So I'm all about it. I've been very involved in that space. I think it's very exciting what's happening. A lot of some of the best like digital health is going on in that space right now. Very interesting stuff. A lot of um, a lot of tech around it, and a lot of interesting ways to deliver care. Because as you noted, we don't really have enough people out there who are trained to manage and help people through this normal process. And so, but now you have your phone. You know what I mean. So you can engage with a healthcare provider who is trained in this and also understand what your options are and get those options delivered in the mail. This is where tech is amazing. So if you're living in an area where you just are not going to have great access to care, I I don't think it's going to replace, it can't replace health completely. There's things that we have to do. We have to make sure that you are having an exam. We have to do your screening. We want you to get, you know, your general health care, but I think you shouldn't be limited by living in an area where you don't have, I mean, I, Listen, I'm in LA. We're in LA. You should hear the stories I hear every day. Mm. People coming in from doctors here in our community. And I'm like, what? Wow. So <laughs> you're at Cedars, right? I mean, I'm I'm in private practice, but Got that's it. my main hospital. Yeah. yeah. Or you were there, you trained there. I trained there. Yeah. I trained right. there. And I'm on I'm on staff there. Yeah. I'm on volunteer staff. Hey, if you like that video, you need to check out this one here and I'll see you there. I'm mm. actually in the middle of doing a hormone test right now that is 28 days and it's a saliva test. So I have been spitting into a vial like every four. I have a lot of frozen, like vials of frozen saliva in, in your freezer. My freezer right wow. now. Wow. 